Yes, good morning and welcome to Ireland AM. It's November the 3rd, which means it's only now 52 sleeps till Christmas. Dashing through the snow, 101 horse open sleigh. Yeah. Ooh, sorry about that. I'm going to do this every day I'm here between now and the big day. He actually is. He's going to do it. OK, I, I can't find him. I can't find him. <laughs> now, uh, coming up, Athetic Simon Harris has been warned that a victory for Donald Trump in Tuesday's US presidential election could have significant consequences for Ireland. We'll be discussing that story and everything else making your morning papers. We're looking back on what was a hectic day for the Premier League, including losses for both Man City and Arsenal. We'll have all your morning sport shortly. We'll hear from one woman about her inspiring journey with chronic MS, a condition that affects over 9,000 people in Ireland. According to Parent Line, on any given day, 60,000 children won't show up for school here in Ireland. While most are absent with illness, many simply refuse to go. We learn the best ways to help your child manage school anxiety and assist their return to the classroom. And his books have sold over 275 million copies. Author Jeffrey Archer will be revealing where he finds new inspirations for his crime tales after all these years. Now let's have a first look at your morning paper, starting with the Sunday Independent, which leads with gap between big two titans as Martin targets Fine Gael. The paper reports on a new opinion poll which finds that while Fine Gael remains the country's most popular political party, Fianna Fáil are quickly closing the gap ahead of the general election. From page of the Business Post reads, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael to woo middle class with tax cuts. The paper writes that battle lines are now being drawn on issues of economic and enterprise policy between the three large parties vying to lead the next government. The Sunday Times leads with Donald Trump victory is the worst result, Simon Harris is told. The paper writes that Taoiseach Simon Harris has been warned that a Donald Trump victory in Tuesday's US presidential election could significantly impact Ireland's windfall corporation tax receipts within a year of the former president retaking the White House. On to the tabloids in the Irish Mail on Sunday leads with why did our baby boy die from meningitis? The paper reports that the parents of a seven-month-old baby have called for an independent inquiry into how their child died from suspected septic shock after contracting meningitis. The Sunday Mirror leads with horror of kids' care deaths. The paper claims that up to 227 children have died in state care, according to a new dossier. And finally, the Sunday World goes with the headline <coughs> Cartel's Shot of Coffee. The paper states that two men associated with the Kinahan Cartel have opened a coffee shop in Dublin just months after being released from jail. Now, Gen Z pop star Olivia Rodrigo, who is currently on a press tour for her concert film Guts, has made headlines recently for revealing a pretty unusual dating red flag. Now, this has sparked a conversation about our own dating red flags and the oddly specific things that might put you off on an otherwise successful first date. You can let us know yours on WhatsApp at 0896111111. So what's Olivia saying? Tell us. I love this so much, OK? So she asks a question on a first date. She asks them, would they want to go to space? And if they say yes, that's a red flag. I 100% agree with so that. So do I. Yeah. But you like your Star Trek and things like this, but yeah. you don't want to go to space. <clears throat> Not that I don't want to go to space. Let's, let me be clear. But let's say in the future, right? Yeah. If you're, you're married and you've a few, well, not me, I'm well past that. But let's say you're married and a few kids and, yeah. you, and this Egypt that you're married to decides, you know what, I'm going to go up out on a rocket ship that could explode. You could, I, it's not just space, by the way. I would consider wanting to go thousands of feet under the sea in a submarine as well, looking at the Titanic. I would consider wanting to She's cl already, yeah. climbing oh, Mount oh, Everest just, just for the crack. Make notes. That's up there right. as well. I mean, climbing Mount Everest for the, just the, the fun of it. Rowing across between here and Antarctica by yourself. Uh, there's a want to people who want to do that. Anything extreme. If you're putting yourself... Because that, that says it, 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 you're happy to put yourself at risk. And, and not care about the consequences okay. yeah. of your family. That says he's a spacer. And yeah. Olivia wants exactly. to get away. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Now, yeah. if he's just paddling his own canoe and wants to do it now, that's fair enough. If yeah. they're happy to do it. But I would myself not want anyone to want to go oh, to Yeah, space. you're looking for someone out of this world, but not in that sense. Yes. You know? OK, so she it's says you're a little too full of yourself. Uh, you're a bit weird if you want it's to go into space. The bang of Elon Musk off it is a bit strong, isn't it? I actually yeah. think that Olivia yeah. Rodrigo has un uncovered something primal here. Yes, you know, we yeah. don't want someone who's going to be super <laughs> risky, you know? Yeah. A little, little risk is fine, but I think it's, it's a huge selfishness to put your life at risk if you have a family and exactly. kids who need you. Exactly. Okay. Okay. That's my opinion. Um, there are other things on, on the list here there as is. well. Yes, there are. So Image magazine recently published their slightly less um, mental than Olivia's, uh, but more common ones. So number one is they're stingy with money. That is so true. If you're stingy yep. with money, you're stingy with everything else. Okay. Number two is 
Well, it's something that bothers me if I'm sitting at a table mm. with a pile of people and somebody comes over and puts food down in front of them and they just... And they don't acknowledge. Acknowledge the fact that somebody... Yeah. Yeah. If they're rude to hospitality staff. I know yeah. someone who was dumped, actually. Her engagement was broken off because she was rude to a, a waitress at a restaurant. The engagement was called yeah. off. How Ooh. rude was she? Rude Must enough. have been bad. You know who it is as well, I'll tell you in the break. <laughs> <laughs> People are going, no, you, no, no, tell us now. <laughs> Another one is if they don't ask you any questions. Yeah. Because everyone, you want to talk about yourself. Yeah. Yeah, but sometimes you're just nervous and you blab. Blah, 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 blah. Red flag. You're yeah. the red, you are I'm the red, red flag, flag there. I'm just, okay. I have so many red flags, I'm practically a circus. But you don't want to go to space, so that's a good thing. Okay. No, I want to go to oh, space. Oh, sorry. But can't keep if up. I had kids. Yeah. Okay. And a husband, I would not go to space for yeah. fear I'd pop my clogs. Yeah, okay. I know. Well, I, I, I know. I love space I know is a dangerous there's place. There's a few others here uh, regarding <coughs> talking about your ex on the first date and your phone. But uh, down number, number six. six, if they support Donald Trump, gone. I'd walk straight out. <laughs> yeah, alarm bell. Out the pub. <laughs> What's okay. yours? Let us know at 0896 treble one treble one. Now after the break with the general election just around the corner, we're looking at the latest opinion polls and everything else making your morning papers. See you for that in three. You're very welcome back to Ireland AM now with the general election fast approaching. The latest Sunday independent opinion poll has found that Fine Gael remains the country's most popular political party. Now, joining us with that story and everything else this morning is political correspondent for the Irish Times, Jack Horgan-Jones, and consumer journalist and editor of European supermarket magazine, Siobhan McGuire. Thank you both so much for joining us on the show this morning. Jack, I'll go to you first. Another day, another opinion poll. Exactly. Any coming... surprises in this one? Uh, well, yes and no. Mm. So, I mean, the, the, the Ireland Thinks polls in the Sunday Independent, one of which is published this morning, they're always good for kind of data nerds and, and people who are really into digging into it. As um, in your good self. As, uh, as I am. So if you look at it at a headline level, there's not much change. It's kind of in keeping with the trend, which either suggests that people have their mind made up or much more likely the electorate is kind of wound like a spring and ready to to, to pounce into the general election. But exactly, get us into yeah. the polling booth. <laughs> and, and in fairness, the, the data does, does support this more generally, that about half of people only make up their mind on who to vote for during the campaign proper, which hasn't even begun, even mm. though the de facto campaign is yeah. underway. Now, the, the couple of interesting data points to, to pick out from beyond the headline figures, which, as we say, don't don't show a huge amount of change. Fianna Gael on 26, no change. Fianna Fáil plus one on 20 and Sinn Féin minus one on 18. So that's the headline figure. But what they've done is quite interesting. They've asked at a constituency level with candidates as opposed to parties, who would you vote for? And those figures show a much closer race when you include the candidate as opposed to just the party brand between Fianna Gael and Fianna Fáil. So that 26% for Fianna Gael comes down to 23% and the 20% for Fianna Fáil goes up to 21%. So the difference is just two points as opposed to six points. So we're going so that, to first preferences there, is it? It's, it's only first preferences as well. Oh, okay. So, I mean, it's very difficult to yes, predict, of course. you know, multi-seat constituency. There's proportional the representation RFD. here. Exactly, but it does, it does indicate that one of the things that everyone has flagged as a concern for Fine Gael, which is the retirement of big vote-getting political brands at a constituency level, mm. might actually narrow the race between them and uh, negate to some extent the kind of new energy brand that Simon Harris is bringing to the table mm. at a headline national level. And that when all the shouting is done and when all the votes are counted, it might be a lot closer between Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil than those kind of headline national figures do suggest. What's the margin of error in polls like that? Uh, in this one, I think it's 2.4%. <coughs> okay. So Which it's, us it's usually between well, yeah. 2 and 3%. Yeah, so I mean, again, that, that goes to show that like at a headline level, those national figures, they're, they're not only are they not showing much change, but they're, they're well within the margin of error, you know, yeah. so there's not not a huge amount of, of movement, but it does, it, when you when, again, when you drill down into it, it's very interesting because it suggests that the strong preference of a significant amount of the electorate is for Fianna Gael, Fianna Fáil plus independence in the next government. 42% of voters saying that they want to see a, a government of those three kind of mm. entities coalescing. And, and when, the, when the least popular choices for government formation are excluded, that jumps to 69% of people wow. want to see Fianna Gael, Fianna Fáil plus independence. Wow. Which I think it's actually less likely than... Fianna Gael, Fianna Fáil, plus smaller parties of the left. Now, the Greens don't mm. seem to be looking too good in some way. The, thought, the thoughts of them being returned to the government, what do you, what do you feel on that? Well, it's about damage limitation for yeah. the Greens. They, they, they had a bit of a surge in 2020, as we know, 12 TDs. I mean, there is no way 
I mean, the commentators curse here, but like, there is no way on the face of the planet they're going to come back with 12 TDs the next time. But they might be part of a centre left mm. block consisting of themselves, Social Democrats and Labour, that might have between 12 and 20 TDs, and depending on how things mm. go. And that, if it coalesces together and kind of bargains as one platform with the other two big mm. parties, and this also is presupposing that Sinn Fein aren't in the, in the discussion, which they may very well be they could perform, uh, they could act as that kind of third leg to a stool mm. in the next government. Um, I suppose it comes down between the, the, the battle of the leadership as well, because Simon Harris and, and, and uh, Micheál Martin, <laughs> a bit of a jab towards uh, Simon Harris, <laughs> Micheál Martin said, and I quote, he's a person of substance rather than a person of soundbite, and uh, that he has strength. Simon has strengths and he has strengths, and he's, I suppose he's tenure as Minister for Foreign Affairs, etc., and he's wide political career. He seems to be like bigging that up uh, as uh, the potential next Taoiseach. Yeah, you know, it's it's really interesting. We were talking about this before we, we came on about uh, Micheál Martin's very, very long political career thus far. And then you have, you know, the young whippersnapper, uh, Simon Harris coming in as the TikTok, uh, Taoiseach, you know, uh, TikTok down, down with the young people, you know, and so you have you have both of these um, at, at kind of loggerheads, you know, what do you want? Somebody who's been uh, across the political landscape for a very long time up against somebody who's coming in with a bit of change, you know, and bringing in uh, younger friends um, to take on very high positions within He survived government. a lot of upheaval in Fianna Fáil. He really has, yeah. And in his current position, um, you know, in the the foreign affairs uh, yeah. foreign affairs department, he's actually he's coming out quite strong. You know, he's proving himself, you know, ex extremely important in terms of speaking about issues like like what's going on yeah. with Israel and Palestine. Um, and uh, hearing him in the last week on Irish radio, um, he, he's been a very credible source. Michal Martin. States Kind of life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And answering questions. You know, there's yeah. been, a, I don't know if you've noticed this, Jack, but I, I've noticed that in recent weeks, politicians are suddenly answering questions as opposed to kind of flitting around, you know. I they mean, usually, they flit very well, though, in terms of the Jack, normally. Yes, they, they have to be, they have to be light on their feet, all right. But you're yeah. right. I mean, because part of the thing that the two large parties, government in particular, have to do at the moment is differentiate each other from each other because they've been in coalition for so long. So yeah. that's why I think. I think you see these pot shots being taken and the Greens are at it as well, mm -hmm. you know, saying that the that Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil have no real interest in climate policy, but particularly Michal Martin and Simon Harris, um, you know, yeah. workhorse versus show pony, all these kind of things and experience versus novelty. God, I'm getting mental images. I really didn't need this hour on a Sunday morning. Thank you so much for that. Like, we have to move on to other mental images I don't really like thinking about on a Sunday morning. It is Donald Trump, but because of course our election isn't the only one in the offing. There's a huge one uh, coming up next week, Siobhan, in the US and it could have serious ramifications for Ireland and our corporation tax. Simon Harris has been told if Trump wins, it's not good for us. Yeah, Sunday and the Times leads with that story. That's today. right, and but uh, you know, and we had this same debate back in 2016 because you know, um, U.S. foreign direct investment in Ireland is so important. You know, it was worth 491 billion last year, 2.1 trillion across the EU. It's a massive chunk of money. Ireland took in something like 24 billion in corporation tax last year alone. So um, the idea of, of Trump coming in, and he's coming in with this with this idea that, you know, he's, t he's telling uh, people who will vote for him that America is at a disadvantage at the moment. That basically, you know, everything that's good about America and, and being uh, exported abroad, like foreign direct investment, is of no use to America, the country. So he's talking about reducing corporation tax. Um, it's 21%. He wants to bring it down to 15%. Kamala, she wants to raise it up to 28%. Yeah. He's talking about massive tariffs on imports from China, uh, 6 60% tariffs. He's talking, he's talking about massive tariffs from Europe between 10 and 20%, and that includes us. So all of that has a knock-on effect on the Irish economy. But again, it's it, it's no real difference in terms of what we were discussing when he got in first time around. So it is a kind of wait and see. The election on Tuesday, he's already declaring it Liberation Day. 
um, you know, in the hope that people will come out and, and vote sure. for I'm him. very, very thankful for Simon Harris, Micheál Martin, Mary Lou MacDonald and everybody else in this country when I look at the likes of what's going on over in the States, Jack, to be fair, it's, it's, it's just beggar's belief really, doesn't it? Yeah. The actual I mean, toxicity of this race. It, it does. And I think that, you know, in terms of domestic politics here, that'll be an important framing thing as well, because we'll have the, the US election then a couple of days later, the election uh, here will be called and people will be looking at chaos, yeah. I think, in the US, no matter who, who wins. Just on the, on the, the, the trade implications of, of a second Trump presidency, I think they could be very grave. I mean, you don't associate the word consistency with Donald Trump to a great extent, but there are two kind of enduring um, aspects to his uh, political philosophy, such as it is, one is migration and the second is trade. He views yeah. trade as a, a zero sum game. And he thinks that the, the US is getting screwed over by, by, you know, bad actors from overseas. And I think that, you know, we fall into that kind of bad actor category within his head. Yeah. And he's spoken about how Ireland lures jobs away from America before uh, when he was last here at Doombag last year. So look, I, the question when it comes to if he was to get in and how damaging a Trump presidency could be for Ireland is how effective he would be. And he wasn't very effective the first time, but there would be just a, a large degree of uncertainty associated mm. with him being in the Oval Office, whether or not he was able to, you know, bring down the yeah. corporate tax rate and engage in tariff wars remains to be seen. But just that volatility, that uncertainty is damaging in and of itself. Well, we'll all know the next time I see you guys anyway. So watch this space. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we'll be reporting on it thick and fast over the next few weeks. We'll be burnt out from elections uh, by the time Christmas comes around. Thank you both so much for joining us on the show this morning. Now, after the break, are Liverpool the team to beat in this year's Premier League? Well, there's something I never thought I'd be saying either. And we're talking all things sport in just a few minutes. You're very welcome back to Ireland DM. The annual MS Readathon has inspired generations of Irish children to read as much as they can, all to raise essential funds for the more than 9,000 people across Ireland living with MS. This November marks the 37th year of this initiative. And joining us in the studio to share more about this year's Readathon is Orla Marin, who is living with MS herself. Good morning, Orla. Good morning. Thank Great you to so have much. you on. Oh, thanks for having me. So you've been living with MS for eight years, but maybe bring us back to the point just before your diagnosis. Like what brought on the suspicions that you need to go and see a doctor? Okay, well, I sort of, um, I've sort of digging my head in the sand because I've grown up with MS. My mum has MS. So um, I sort of knew symptoms and I was sort of passing them off and uh, saying, Oh, life is busy and putting them down to everything and everything bar going to the doctors mm. because I felt as if I knew what was coming but I didn't want to be actually told what it was but it got to a stage that I physically couldn't continue on I remember walking into work and my legs were like concrete and I was dragging myself in I was having pain down the right hand side of my face that I wanted to rip the skin so it's neuralgia it's called and it's so painful and I said, right, I actually can't continue on. There's more to life than this. this there's something seriously wrong. I need to go to a doctor. Um, and I did. Um, and I seeked help. And I got the diagnosis that I think I knew was coming, but didn't want. Yeah. Mm. It's strange that you were, because you knew what your mother went through mm -hmm. and you knew what it probably was, that you were so, well, not strange, but that's not the word, but that you were so fearful of it. Yeah. Uh, like, why was that, do you think? I think it's because I can see how it impacts your daily life because like people do have fatigue um, and it doesn't mean that they have MS and people do have pains and aches and uh, pins and needles. Again, it might not be MS. So I think I was just more hopeful that it wasn't it. Yeah, yeah. What are the chances of it being in the house again? It's mm -hmm. not a hereditary disease. What were the chances? So I think I was more going, oh, if I ignore this, this isn't happening because I could see the impact it had. My, my mum never let her MS affect us growing up. Um, so, but I could see the impact and the decline that she has been having. So I think it was more that, no, if I don't get my diagnosis, I don't have to accept this. It's not going to happen. Yeah. It's in denial. It's classic denial. Yeah. Really, Absolutely. It. Yeah. yeah. And what was it like then telling your mom your diagnosis? Which that was actually the funny bit because um, I funny <laughs> no it actually was um, so my doctor had rang because I went into my doctor and I said oh I think I've MS and he said oh, Orla it's not hereditary you don't and I said no I actually really think I do he sent me for an MRI for peace of mind he rang me he goes your results are back can you come in and I rang my mum on my way to the doctors and I said oh they rang me. 
I'm on my way. And they're like, it's okay, relax, it's fine. Went in, the doctor told me, and I was going straight out to my mum's house and she met me at the door and she goes, what is it, what is it? And I was like, oh my God, I have MS. And she goes, oh, thank God. I was, I was like, what? <laughs> and she goes, we know what we're dealing with. Okay. She goes, I thought it could have been like a brain tumor because the pains yeah, I was yeah, having in my face, or it could have been a lot worse. She goes, mm -hmm. we know what we're dealing with and we can deal with this. And talk about the treatments as well that you're on. I know sometimes you were a bit of a guinea pig for a while trying to yes. find the right one that works for you, but compared to when your mother started treatment and you, there's huge uh, differences nowadays. Oh, massive, absolutely massive. When my mum was diagnosed in 1991, there was only like three or four treatments. And um, now there's like 25, 30 treatments and they've progressed massively um, but like that you need to find one that works for you because the treatment that works for me mightn't work for somebody else mm -hmm. so you do need to find that so that can be the difficult part when you're newly diagnosed is first picking a treatment then seeing if it works giving it time to work learning um, after six months they give you an MRI see if there's any more progression if there is that treatment hasn't worked you have to be flushed out of that treatment pick another treatment. So it took, it was third time's a charm for me. So it was my third treatment that worked for 18 me. 18 months it took you to get the property. It was over was two, yeah, it was nearly two years into my third year um, before I got a treatment that actually started to slow the disease down. Mm. I suppose when you get a diagnosis like this, it's hard. It's something that's hard to wrap your head around, you know? Did you know about the supports that were available because your mom had been through the same? But this is it. I was very lucky. Mm. And I'm probably lucky might be the right word to use for it. But I was lucky in the way that I knew who to turn to. I knew what MS Ireland did because I was, I've grown up with it. I've seen what the supports they give to my mum. So when I was diagnosed, I knew straight away who I needed to turn to. Mm. And that's why I wanted to be the ambassador this year was because I've met so many people who are newly diagnosed and they didn't know where to go. They didn't know where to turn to. I was fortunate that yes, I was diagnosed with MS, but I knew exactly where to turn to, what supports to get. And I am so grateful for everything that I've got in the past few years, because I really, I wouldn't be here on this couch with you only for the supports that I've got in the past seven years. It's so important to have as well. But I know you've been talking about your own mother there yeah. and she was, thank God, we know what it is and in case there's anything worse for you. But your mother yourself, so telling your own kids about that, how, how did you navigate that? I only told them this year because they were too young. They were too young. Like I said, my mum never let her diagnosis affect us growing up. So that was my aim was to not let it affect them. So, um, but, but like I said, they're older now. So um, they can see me going into hospital every six months for treatment. And I had to explain, they're not silly now. Mm. You could, like when they were younger, you could pass it off going, oh, mum's going away for the day mm. and I'll be back. and if I was sleeping and, or if I was having bad days, granny and granda would take them away mm. or my husband would have them away or whatever, you could pass it off. But now that they're older, they have more questions, so you couldn't really pass yeah. it off. So um, I did tell them and they were brilliant about it. And I just said to them, look, mommy will have good days and mommy will have bad days. Uh, but on those bad days, we'll focus on what we can do. So mm. I mightn't be able to go out and play football or jump on a trampoline with you, but we can sit and watch a movie. We you can, can read, read a book. book. Exactly. exactly. And that's why you're here as well. Uh, exactly, yes. So tell us about the MS Readathon. MS Readathon, it's an epic reading adventure for anybody from young old and everybody in between. Um, it's a whole month from the 1st of November to the 15th of December, a reading challenge. And it doesn't have to be picking up a book. It can be a comic book. It can be a magazine. You can download your audio book. Um, and it's just reading, get sponsorship and raise vital funds because all that money, it's all that money is used to pay for all the services that I've availed of in the last seven years. Mm. And like I said, I wouldn't be here yeah. without them. Yes. Um, so it's so, so important. Yes, I'm sure you'll be reading mad with your kids anyway yes. over the next one. Thank you yes. so much for joining Thank us on the show. Order. It's been Thank lovely so chatting much. to you. Thank you. You can find out more about MS and this year's MS Readathon by visiting the website msreadathon.ie. We'll take a quick break now, but still to come, we're looking at what to do when your kids won't go back to school. If you need to buy them, we've also got seven layer chocolate bars in the kitchen. Look at us. We'll see you then. Seven there's <laughs> You're very welcome back to Ireland AM, the only place in Ireland where we drink more coffee than tea, but 
Bags be really easy. Oh, anyway. Sunday morning. <laughs> Coming up with Parent Line reporting that 60,000 children are absent from school every day in Ireland. We'll be prepping parents to handle kids who might not want to go back to class after the midterm break. In fashion, we're focusing on looks using different shades, tones and textures within the same colour family. In what the fashion world has dubbed monochrome dressing, we'll explain all a little bit later. Plus, he is one of the world's best-selling authors. Jeffrey Archer will be telling us why he has a bone to pick with Taylor Swift, of all people. Can't wait to hear that one. Now, she was in the kitchen with Chrissy. There's something delicious on the way, I see. Always, always with Chrissy. Now, we all have a chocolate bar now and then, but what if I told you Chrissy Gibson is going to make us seven bars in one? Yeah, you kind of. Yeah. yeah. They are called, called seven layer bars. Okay. And that's because there's seven ingredients and we do them in layers, so, you know. But um, they, we can we can use leftover buttons from Halloween if you have any. So Both these are good for that. there's any sweets left over from Halloween. Right? I'm an optimist, <laughs> what can I say? It's the third of November, I'd say they're all gone by this point. Okay, delicious, we can't wait to get our teeth into that. Now we'll have another look in your morning paper starting with the Sunday Independent which leads with gap between big two titans as Martin targets Fine Gael. The paper reports on a new opinion poll which finds that while Fine Gael remains the country's most popular political party, Fianna Fáil are quickly closing the gap ahead of the general election. Front page of the Business Post reads Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael to woo middle class with tax cuts. The paper writes that battle lines are now being drawn on issues of economic and enterprise policy between the three large parties vying to lead the next government. The Sunday Times leads with Donald Trump victory is the worst result, Taoiseach is told. The paper writes that Taoiseach Simon Harris has been warned that a Donald Trump victory in Tuesday's US presidential election could significantly impact Ireland's windfall corporation tax receipts within a year of the former president retaking the White House. On to the tabloids in the Irish Mail on Sunday leads with why did our baby boy die from meningitis? The paper reports that the parents of a seven-month-old baby have called for an independent inquiry into how their child died from suspected septic shock after contracting meningitis. The Sunday Mirror leads with horror of kids' care deaths. The paper claims that up to 227 children have died in state care according to a new dossier. And finally, the Sunday World goes with the headline Cartel's Shot of Coffee. The paper states that two men associated with the Kinahan cartel have opened a coffee shop in Dublin months after being released. Now, we were discussing earlier red flags because the singer Olivia Rodrigo came up with an absolute whopper of a red flag that if a man wants to go to space, that's <laughs> it, he's, he's done. Um, but great text coming in. Joan says, went on a first date with a guard and he walked me back to the car. I caught him checking my tax disc. <laughs> <laughs> now, he could have done that for a joke. He could have just done that for a laugh. No. no. Or maybe he was like, could it be nice and pointed out and... The tax is out. Oh, yeah. oh Lord, Lord, Lord. Yeah. Uh, Clodagh <laughs> says, when I started talking about something I liked, my ex would sometimes cut me off or his eyes would just glaze over. Oh, that's horrible. Mm. That's horrible now. OK, Carmel yeah. says, dirty fingernails is a major no-no. Need I say any more? Well, if you're she? a mechanic or you're working with your hands and, and doing washing, like that. Very hands, hard. You can wash very, your hands, but it's hard really clean. hard sometimes to get... It gets really ingrained, like oil. Because you're not talking about dirt, you're talking about oil, oil in some and, cases. Like, stuff like that yeah. is fair enough. Like, no, she was to, already said yeah, no. You put your fingers in bleach the, to get it all the off. The shutters come well, down. Then, the, there you go. Grease yeah. or something. Oh, good God. Okay. Anyway, but yeah, dirty fingernails by and large are yeah. a bit gross. Uh, Absolutely. John recalls the first day he went on where they made fun of the music he liked and the TV shows he watched. Uh, that's just that's yes, that's, that's just a bit rip, mean. That's yeah. ripping your heart out and kicking it around the yeah. floor. Yeah. Oh. Well. Yeah. No, it is. It is. Uh, and well. <laughs> Maybe they're just trying to be like funny and like tease you. Well, it didn't work, love. It no, didn't it didn't, work. in fairness. Uh, Emer Fair says, play to you, John. Yeah. Emer says he started talking about taking me on a holiday to his home country while we were still in the early stages of texting. Okay. If you have texting? Any, yeah. Ooh, yeah. That's a bit intense now, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, when they complain about their ex, says Alice, on their first date, that's a huge red flag. I think that's ridiculous as well. If you're complaining about your ex, forget about it, get in the sea. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Why would you be talking about them anyway? Not unless you're asked. But even so, like, just don't. Shut up. Yeah. Your relationship should take yeah, this will be your potential yeah. new relationship, yeah. not the one you just got out of. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, Martin, how many days left till Christmas? Well, 52. There we go, approximately. Um, there was a new poll done by the journal uh, about people's attention already turning to Christmas and they asked their readers if they'd started their shopping yet. Couple and there's bits, actually yeah. like oh yeah. really yeah food so bits yeah you are part of the 33.6 percent that have already started their Christmas shopping 
Okay. Some people have started as last January. I know some people are oh, really organised. The sales. They go out in the sales. You see, they're very smart. Yeah, they're very smart. And who has money in January anyway? Well, that's well, what I want to yeah. know. Yeah. Five but points. What's the point? If, if, if that person is asking, so what do you want for next Christmas? Yeah. I'll get it for you this week. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I then mean, they stick it under the bed for a year. <laughs> I, I'm strongly contemplating um, doing a bit of Christmas shopping early this year just to be organised. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I know. I know. I, I have, have a couple of bits. Who gets, so, yeah. who has it all sorted by the, by the end of September, early October. Well, 9.2% intend to start this week. That's yourself. Mm -hmm. And 5.7% are already finished. You see, they can sit back now and laugh at the rest of us as we I panic. I'd be ridiculously organised. I haven't got one thing. Yeah. I'm one of the 51.5% that will start in December. That's I, I put up, I, I'm contemplating putting up my tree soon. <laughs> okay. I haven't put up a tree for three years and I just think Christmas brings joy and happiness and sparkles no, and lights. Does. And, and, and we were told yesterday about Alison Keating, twinkly lights cheer you up if you yeah. have yeah. an affective disorder. So it, it cheers me up, so why not? Pick the tree up in the My corner daughter told me go. yesterday that she's putting her Christmas tree up today. Oh, yeah. good luck to her. That's a really good thing. Before we go, very quickly, I want to say a shout out to uh, Mr. James Doran. Uh, he's a great fan of the show. A big hello from all hey, of us. Hey, James. There, from your son, Jimmy Jr. Anyway, Aww. hope you have a lovely okay. weekend, rest of the weekend. Anyway. Uh, oh, there okay. you go. He's going to be rewarded with his place in heaven without question after yeah. watching us. I'd say there so, yeah. Go. Thank there you. There we go. Is Christmas tree up? That's what I want to <laughs> yeah. know. Yeah. Well, okay. actually, actually, Stephen Fry did a programme uh, a couple of years back where he said that uh, the Christmas season actually starts early in November and finishes the first weekend of February. So that's when it goes that. from there. there. Now we've got it from the official okay. source. Yeah. We'd love to know, what have you done? Have you shopped already? Have you got a few bits in? Uh, uh, 0896 treble one treble one is how you get in touch. Now, us. after the break, the midterms are wrapping up. But what should you do if your kids don't want to go back to school? We're discussing that in just a few minutes. Welcome back. Well, the midterms are coming to an end and while it's important that our young children get up to plenty of mischief around Halloween, it can be tough for them to adjust back to the classroom. Now, here to teach us how to deal with children refusing to return to school are the hosts of Mind Mum podcast, psychotherapist and counsellor Bethan O'Reardon. And fr from Kitarama, we have Steph McSharry. Thank you both so much for joining us on the show this morning. Steph, I will start with you. Why is it that children and young people mainly refuse to go to school? I think it's difficult because we have such lovely home environments now. We have all the technology, we have the lovely big screens and the PlayStation. So, yeah, home is a nice place to be. We were talking when we were coming up in the car. If you were off sick when you were a kid, you know, there was perhaps daytime telly. It was a bit boring at home. So, actually, you'd actually prefer to be at yeah, school. Yeah, you were looking at a test card. Yeah, if you did exactly. Switch yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah. So it's a bit different now. You know, home's a nice place to be. OK, now, pe people always say they've only been off for a week, but this time of year, Beth, is, is different because the clocks have gone back and, yes. you know, the evenings are darker, so there's less playtime outside for kids, for those who like to go outside to play. Yeah, yeah. So this is a difficult midterm for kids to read just from, especially after all the excitement of Halloween. Yeah, and I think all the buzz of Christmas coming up mm. as yeah, well. Yeah. And I think mentally, you know, yeah, life at home can be really nice, but I think mentally for a lot of children, being in school and knowing that they might be going back to an environment that maybe doesn't suit them, that they don't feel okay in, especially for the teens, it's a time of enormous brain development, life changes, trying to fit in. There is so much for teenagers to consider these days other than just rocking up and going to school. It's really so much more complicated than it was for me. Yeah, a school refusal for many, I suppose, is, is seen as untreated school anxiety. What is that and oh. how can uh, we help our children and teens through it? I think, so for me, I think there's two different kinds that I see in my therapy practice with teens. So one is when children are totally stuffed. They've been really overwhelmed in life and they're saying, I can't do this anymore, I need a break. And then there's another kind where teenagers are saying, I feel like I actually can't leave the house. I actually can't leave the house anymore. I can't do anything. So that's what I'm seeing in my therapy practice and what I'm helping parents with their teenagers Is it overwhelm? I think a lot of it is overwhelm and children or teenagers, young adults, kind of just shutting down and saying, I can't do this anymore. But how can parents differentiate and how can parents help their children? Because in a school environment, you might have 20 odd children in a class and they're not going to be able to individually 
pick one child and uh, and nurture them through because this, the numbers just don't add up for that. Yeah, I mean, so in my work, the family is the training ground for life. And I'm not, I mean, I'm a mom of three kids. I have a teenager. But the reality is, is that we live with our children. So we have this amazing opportunity to help them because we're with, the, with them kind of 24 seven. So it is really hard and there is great joined up initiatives with school. But what I say to parents is, is think because it's really hard for parents not to get cross or upset or angry or think where have I gone so wrong what have I done for the last 13 years that's brought us to this place and I say well if you imagine that you're, you're, when your child's a toddler and they fall and they cut their knee you go to them and you say oh come here and you care for them and you love them and you want them to feel safe it's this kind of safeness teens are looking for not like someone's going to come and attack them but like an inner safeness of knowing that my panic and my calm can be cared for by my mum and dad mm. so it's still a hug not necessarily a plaster on the knee but still still that reassurance that, that children need. But when, yeah. when, when they are refusing to go to school, it can be very upsetting. If you're driving in your car and your child is sitting in the seat behind you crying, mm. it's very difficult for a parent not to just get drive past the gate and head on home. And to get wrapped up in all the shame that goes with that. Because yeah. obviously within the family and within the other mothers at the school gate, they can feel a bit ashamed about that that they can't quite get their kid into school. OK, yeah. but, but we do live in a different time now, mm. so you, you, you need to go in and talk yeah. to the school, to, to the principal yeah. and to the teachers to try and find a way to fix this. Yeah, and there are amazing frameworks out there for that. I know Tusla run, um, it's called a METAL framework, where they bring everybody around the table. So it's the school, maybe it's the GP, it could be the OT, it could be the child and the child family, and they work as a team and they come up with a six week plan to really help that family get that child back to school. So I think that's a really great initiative. There is support, there's a lovely Facebook group out there, school related anxiety and attendance issues. That's specifically in Ireland and that's really helpful for parents too, so that they don't feel that they're on their own. Yeah. Um, is it ever a good idea to force return to school? Do you need to sometimes tough love it, to use an old cliche there? Oh, it's such a delicate balance. But here's the thing, we need to, our young people and teenagers need to know that while you're feeling like you're having a really hard time, it's still possible to do things. Like me here, I'm very nervous, but I'm still here yeah. doing it. You know, and it's the yeah. same for our teens. You can feel rotten inside. You can feel like you're having the worst day that nobody likes you, but you can also get on with your life. And this is the most delicate balance. And I say to parents, go slow. When they learn to walk, you didn't put them running a marathon day two. And it's almost like sometimes we need to allow teens the space and the time to go slow, but I know that impacts family life. So there's no quick solution, there's no easy solution, but parents are the change their children need. Yeah. Uh, this is the first break um, that first years in secondary school would, would, would have gotten after yes. that overwhelming step from primary into secondary school. So are, are, are the, the bulk of the people that you, are children you would, you would chat with and deal with, are they generally in and around that first year? I would say no, I, I would say all different ages. I would meet a lot of um, kids in their final year of school, their final two years of school, because the parents are saying, oh, come on, we need to get this together so you can do your leaving, leaving sort of kind of thing. Pressure. Yeah, and, and, and I think, yeah, the first year, so that's, my son's one of those kids as well who's just gone to secondary. I think it is like a whirlwind of information, organisation, um, and it's a lot for them to wrap their heads around, mm. and the mums too. Yeah, yeah it's so, the classes. Yeah. And where's your coat? Oh. Well, Whereas anything, yeah, yeah. <laughs> going back to the school gates because they left their pencil cases, their set squares, something, something, yeah. their iPad yeah. after them. But uh, Steph, realistically speaking, school anxiety is not the only reason that some children mm -hmm. are refusing to go to school. Sometimes they're rebelling; they don't want to. And that's about it. Yeah, and we often talk on the podcast about kind of playing detective with your kids a little bit, kind of working out what what is really going on. Is it really about not going to school because something's happening at school that they don't? Maybe there's a bullying situation, maybe there's a teacher they're not getting on with, maybe they are finding everything overwhelming, or is there actually something going on with them at home that they're really not happy and that's how it's coming out. And that might be control over food, it might be control over I'm going out all the time or not going to school. So yeah. really try and So play. it could be a control thing rather yeah, than that. Could. But what about the instance when they just prefer staying at home on their PlayStation or their whatever mm. deeper they play these days and they just don't want to go because home is nice, it's lovely, I'm going to 
just sit here and do it and you can't make me go to school because a lot of times remember these kids they might be 13, 14, 15 but they could be over six foot tall mm. and if you're a small mammy trying to force them to do anything it would be impossible. Yeah and maybe the Wi-Fi goes off for the day maybe. Yep. And their controllers maybe. go missing. <laughs> mm, yeah absolutely. Maybe. Because here's the thing the teenage brain is a wild one that it's um, programmed to take risks it's not programmed for logic it's not pro pro programmed for problem solving so saying you've got to go to school because you know you've got to study and do this and that the teenage brain's like I don't care about that. I want to, to do my PlayStation at home. So yes, there is a case for tough love yeah. because that's life, isn't it? Life yeah. is, you go out, you work because that's what we have to do for money and pay bills and life in general. For, for, I, I know we're coming, we're coming towards the end, but for any child who has, who is maybe on the spectrum or has yeah. any kind of uh, uh, ed educational uh, difficulty with, with uh, different subjects in, in education, those breaks at home can be really bad when it comes to an end because they have to go back to the routine of school. Yeah. So for for those children, this end of midterm can be quite tough. Yes, but what I would say then is keep their lives as predictable as possible in other ways. So keep cooking their favourite food at home. Don't change the washing powder. Um, keep everything in their life as structured and normal as possible so that inside they have a sense of reassurance and safeness in what's familiar. Because when they go back to the unfamiliar, they're still scaffolded inside to feel like, OK, I feel safe with this. Okay, listen, thank you both so much for joining us on the show this morning. Food for thought, I think, for a lot of parents out there heading back to school after midterm. Now, if you want to hear more from Beth and Steph, the Mind Mum podcast is available now on all good streaming platforms. After the break, we're over in the kitchen for a seven-in-one chocolate trace. It's calorie-free. Yeah, always here. Always, always calorie-free. <laughs> we'll see you for that in a minute. Welcome back to Ireland and we've got sweet treats galore in the studio today and the crew are not complaining. No. Well, they are giving out because they haven't been allowed to go near them yet. Yes, they have to be a bit patient, but Chrissy Gibson... Another from... few minutes. <laughs> from Take the Cake, Dublin has brought the goods and you're here for two hits of cooking today. What's up yeah. first, Chrissy? Yeah, ignore the pot. That's for our segment, our second segment. Okay. Martin, what do you mean they are not allowed to go near them? I I've never denied you a sweet treat. Uh, yeah, I know, but it's just... Listen, it feels let's as if, give credit where credit is due. To you wait. two have been very strong. I haven't taken I've one never bite known you of have, this. You so much yeah. self-control. Thank you, Chrissy. So we're making seven-layer bars, and they're called seven-layer bars because they have seven layers. layers. And we're going to start with a digestive biscuit crust. Okay, so we're going to use 200 grams of digestive crumbs. I'll turn that off for the time being. Um, and then we're going to add 115 grams of melted butter. So that's about a quarter pound. Okay. okay. And um, the, the first thing you want to do is put your crust in your, your dish. You want to use, a, say, a 9 by 13 casserole dish. Okay. And um, we're just going to press this down as firmly as we can. And you are using a greased Pan, okay, okay, so we can okay. get it out afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So okay. this so part's... So grease rather than parchment paper? Oh, you could also... That's a good question, Martin. You can use parchment paper if you'd like instead. In fact, that's a good idea because... Aren't you just the one with all the good ideas? Because... Um, it's often been said about him. <laughs> Uh, the, the reason it's a good idea is because then you can just lift it out very easily, mm -hmm. let them cool, and then slice them. And the thing about these is you do need to let them cool all the way because um, otherwise they'll kind of make a mess when you go to slice them up. So here we have our crust. We're not going to blind bake this before we add the rest. Okay. We're just, we're just going to leave it as is. <clears throat> yeah. Now, the next ingredient is kind of the secret ingredient. Uh, with sweetened condensed milk, one can. And whenever you are baking with sweetened condensed milk, I don't know what it is. It just always turns out fabulous. And the first time I made these for my family, everyone, including my husband, Kevin, said, these are good. Oh. <laughs> and he... he, he, he is, he, is he your harshest critic? No, the thing is, Martin, he considers himself... We call him Kenevan McGuire. Kenevan. Because he considers himself, you know... In the kitchen. Okay. So, oh, right. Okay. You know, so if that, if it gets the heads up from him, you know it has to okay. be good. Okay. So we've got our condensed milk in there. And what'll happen with this now is when we bake it, it'll caramelize and uh, you'll get sort of that butterscotchy yes. taste. So good. Oh my goodness. Now, okay. that's our second layer. Okay. Third layer, uh, chocolate chips. You can use any chocolate chips you want. I recommend dark chocolate chips because these are sweet enough 
And uh, you what's know, the percentage on them? Whatever you want. Oh, really? Okay. These are, I believe, seventy. Okay. But use whatever you want. Okay. In yeah. fact, you've got a little creative license with these, and I'll go over a couple more of the ingredients and tell you what I mean. Yeah, and I suppose um, you've got the sweetness of the condensed milk, then that might break absolutely. through the bitterness of the dark chocolate. You have enough sweetness in these. They're they're good and sweet, as you will soon find out. Now, how soon? Once, once, you're, <laughs> once you're third, <laughs> Shiva, you know something? You can dig in whenever you want. Oh, I'm not going to stop you. I was just waiting for someone now, to tell me that. this is our third layer, the chocolate chips. Moving on to the fourth layer. For these, mm -hmm. you can use... Leftover buttons from Halloween, assuming you've got any leftover. Yep. You can use, um, they, there's this product on the market now. It's gold chocolate. Have you seen that? No. Sometimes it's called caramilk. Yeah, oh, I've oh, seen yeah, caramilk. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's perfect, okay? Um, I, I prefer uh, a butterscotch chip or a, a caramilk a car caramel button or a gold button. Um, that's really nice for your fourth layer. Uh, for, for this one, I'm going to use white chocolate chips. So we're using two different kinds of chips in these. That's okay. all right with us. You're not going to use potato chips because that would be wrong. No, we'll have enough texture and yeah. salt in our seventh layer, okay. which I will go through seventh. Okay. Now, all in. This on, and then we're going to add coconut. Uh -huh. Now, you've got a couple of options with this too. Obviously, the easiest thing for us to do is to use desiccated coconut. We can get that anywhere in any yeah. baking section, yeah. right? Now, you might know desiccated coconut isn't sweetened, which might be fine for some people. Now, the coconut that I'm using today, you can find in your um, American section of your grocery store. Uh, if, you, if you feel like treating yourself, if you feel like making these a little sweeter, get that because it's grated sweetened coconut. Okay. Okay. Either or, desiccated or sweetened grated, you'll be happy because it'll, it'll turn out great. Last layer, nuts. Now, if you have a nut allergy in your house, you can skip this layer, of course. But what this layer does is it gives a little bit more flavor and texture. Okay. And I always use salted nuts, although you can use either. Right. Um, the thing is, I, there's something about getting a little bit of salt with my yeah. sweet. I, I just love it for yeah, some reason. So now, this is our last layer. Once you have your peanuts on, you can also use walnuts or pecans are really good. Mm. Um, you just press this down with your hands firmly. Oh, really? Yeah. You kind of want to compact it. You do. Okay. And uh, not, not a ton, but we're just going to kind of firm it up there. And then we're going to bake this for 30 minutes at 160, okay? okay? Now, if after 30 minutes, you notice that it's a little bit wobbly, just stick it in for a couple more minutes. Okay. All right. It'll so be should... golden. Yeah. It'll be golden and it'll be, it, it'll look done in the center. It should be completely solid. Side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's just a question. Do you let it cool before you start? Yeah. You, you don't want to slice into it until it's cool. So this, I mean, it's delicious when it's warm, but mm. it's just messy. So if you let it cool all the way, you'll be able to slice through and make proper bars. You're meant to eat these with your fingers, but if you'd like to be oh. civilized like been, Sheba. I have been being very, civilized. I'm going to. She, gonna she, she has now. notions, you see. Um, then mm. you can just eat, use a fork. It's incredible. Go on. Well, you, you, no, it's, I know. I'm a few bites ahead of you. Uh huh. Oh yeah. Aren't those mm. good? It just tastes like more. Oh my goodness! And it, come on, they're really easy. Mm hmm. You just have to you just have to have your shopping done and have the ingredients around. Like I said, buttons are perfectly acceptable for this. If you do happen to have any leftover from Halloween, mm -hmm. the thing is, you need 200 grams. You need 200 grams of each type of chocolate, 100 grams of the coconut, and um, 60 grams of the nuts. I'm trying to figure out what is the predominant taste. Is it the, the, is I it just the caramel? I just got a burst of coconut there. It's lovely. Mm, yeah. I think really it's the caramelky stuff that I'm tasting. So good. And the sweetened condensed milk helps with that. Yeah, I think so. I just have to do a little bit more tasting so I make sure that I can yeah. individually identify You probably won't see Sheba until about half eleven. <laughs> uh, -uh, uh uh you won't. <clears throat> no. I've got plenty more over here. Okay, okay. You don't have to tell me twice. Chrissy, thank you so much. We'll good see to you see you. And by the way, just before we go, you have cast your vote, haven't you? You know I have. <laughs> you know I have. Proudly. Proudly cast her vote, and it wasn't for the fellow with the mad combo. No, mm -hmm. it, or the dodgy it, tan. Or the I almost wore my I voted sticker today, and I thought, you know, they might be 
they, they might be a little annoyed if I do that. But no, no, no. I sure well, do. we've said it now anyway, haven't we? Said it now. Chrissy, thank you so much uh, for seeing a bit. She's a happy girl. <laughs> All right. Full recipe details are on our website. You can find more from Chrissy on Instagram at Take the Cake Dublin. Uh, Chrissy will be back later in the show for a second helping of dessert. But after the break, we've got some suave styles for you over on the catwalk. It's fashion in just a few minutes. Mm. You're all very welcome back. It's time now for fashion. And who better to add some glitz and glam to the catwalk than stylist Rosalind Lipset? What are we talking about today, Ros? Good morning. So today we're talking about monochrome fashion. And everyone kind of thinks monochrome, black and white. Mm -hmm. But that's more with photography. With fashion, monochrome is using the same hues and the same colour tones in one outfit. So you can have burgundy, red. And we are going to give you tips that can take home and add to your own closet. Oh. So you can actually pair things together and recreate outfits in a whole fun different way at home. Okay, okay. so what do we have for us this morning? So we're going to start off with this fabulous look on our gorgeous model here, Yumiko, and sparkle season is upon us. So Yay! we have to get the it's sequence Christmas. Out. I know, November the 1st, we're like Christmas. Um, so we're going to start off with the earrings. This is a beautiful sparkly earring from Crystals & Co. They are a gorgeous Irish brand. And again, we're just adding a pop of gold here to this burgundy look. These are the gold double drop earrings. And I then have those at home, I must admit, and I wear them all over the party. They're gorgeous. Season. And they actually come in loads of different colours as well. And then you have the heart tennis necklace. I love a tennis necklace. Again, just a simple sparkle to add to your look. Now we're going to go on to this look. So we're talking about monochrome dressing and we're looking at adding loads of different pieces to the one look in the same colour with different textures. So we have this beautiful blazer with the pop of sequins on the lapel. This is from vavavoom.ie. It's a really great price there and it is perfect for layering in this way in a monochrome look but could also be really gorgeous with a pair of like leather look pants and you know a black top underneath. So there's loads of ways you can wear it. Today we're specifically looking at the monochromatic fashion that is taking over the runways and it really can be done at home. The best tip I have is organizing your wardrobe in color themes. So if you put all your creams together, all your denims together, all your blacks together, you can find like really different ways to recreate your wardrobe. The texture is lovely there because you have the suede contrasted with the sequin there. Exactly, I love exa I love the satin skirt, then there's the blazer, the sequins, then the kind of suede bag. Again, all the textures really bring this look together. Monochromatic dressing is really good as well. If you're a bit body conscious and you don't want to wear a dress because you can then get the satin skirt, layer it with the blazer, a top, and it does have the same effect as if you're wearing a dress. Um, don't be afraid to mix up the colours too, like different shades of burgundies, different shades of reds. They actually can pair really nicely together. If they're the same tone, really, yeah, they'll work. Exactly, a hundred percent. And I love the satin skirt. I am obsessed with satin skirts. Yes, they they're haven't gone anywhere for the last like year, should they? Haven't they're like, just they're handy. everywhere. They're I had one yesterday. Very comfy. I do love they're it. They're a wardrobe yeah. staple, and I love I cream know, I as do well. Like... <laughs> yeah, you can just pop a cream um, knit with yeah. that satin skirt, and you have a whole new look. Now we're going to go on to the beautiful Karina, dazzling in this look from Pamela Scott with jewellery again from Crystals & Co. And I am obsessed with these earrings. These are the Ooh. black diamond three drop earrings. And if you want a statement piece, this is it. They're an outfit in it themselves. Yeah. They really are. Yeah. Like you don't really need to have much else. We didn't even put a necklace with this look because they are so sparkly. They're enough. Now we're gonna go on to this fabulous black look from Pamela Scott, a family-run Irish business with over 50 years in fashion and 24 stores nationwide, also available on pamelascott.com. Faux fur season is back. Do you guys like a faux fur? Love. Oh, I have so much of it, it's I not even it. funny. I love it. I think it's such a great way to glam up an outfit. I'm like a hibernating bear at this time of year, it's great. I know, I love <laughs> the layering and the cozy looks. And again, it's a great way of looking really glamorous and staying warm. So this is a lovely cropped jacket. Um, we've teamed it here with this ribbed top. It has that like Spanx-like material. So again, really, really flattering and really comfortable to wear. And then we have the tall skirt. Again, as I said, if you put all your colors together in your wardrobe, you'll find that you actually have so much to wear. It makes dressing really easy and really fun. Um, this skirt is fab. It's got the tall detail. Um, it's really like just frilly and beautiful. And I think it's perfect for the festive season. It can be teamed with like and a 
sparkly top. The tiered frills are lovely because they're tiny at the top and then they go bigger as it goes down so it's actually more flattering because exactly. sometimes if the tiers are at the top they make you quite wide but that doesn't work. That's a really that's good point. Quite, mm. Yeah, because it doesn't actually yeah. add bulk to you. The bag I'm obsessed with. Oh, it's like a little me. disco ball in yeah. itself. Yeah. That is the clutch bag in crystal gold mesh, again from Crystals & Co. And then we have classic black heel. You can't go wrong. Again, a wardrobe staple to add to your uh, wardrobe. Goes with absolutely everything. And I think she looks like a fairy princess in this look. A that wardrobe bag princess. is just mesmerising me, though. I think that it is. Like, it's um, beautiful. If, you, if a little girl wore it in pink, she'd wear it to a birthday party. You know, it's like a grown <laughs> it up. It is. It's stunning. <laughs> it's a good sense. Yeah, exactly, but it's fabulous. <laughs> now we have Sarah and we have, we're back again with this beautiful monochromatic look and we're going to start off with the gorgeous earrings they again are from crystals and co they are the pave are the pave or pave i was trying to pave pave bubble dome earrings and they are just such a beautiful piece they are from the bonnie ryan collection actually bonnie ryan did a collaboration with crystals and co and they have such stunning pieces uh, this we've teamed it with a simple fine gold herringbone necklace i'm wearing one myself and they're just lovely if you you're not a big necklace person but you do want to add something to your neck they're really simple now we're going to go on to this fabulous look again from vavavoom.ie a blazer again a handy number pop on over jeans and a top but like we've done it here we've teamed all the different shades of creams and whites and again that's the same color family so don't be afraid to put a white with a beige and a cream you know yeah and, and we add a little pop leopard, leopard. yeah lovely as well. it's lovely yeah it really does add like a little uh, something extra again this is the champagne skirt another fantastic layering piece mm. that would be beautiful with like a really big oversized knit Chunky as well knit, yeah, yeah, yeah like an iron knit or something yeah. and yeah. a pair of boots you've got a whole other outfit there again the bag is absolutely wow piece a statement piece and it'll it can be just that could be your go-to Christmas bag for all the office parties all the nights out that we have coming up and it actually fits a lot it's quite stretchy so you'd be surprised at how much it actually fits I'm just a magpie now my eyes are just going bling 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 I know and that's here. then you know yeah. crystals and colors <laughs> for you then <laughs> then we're going to go on to the gorgeous shoes again it has a little pop of the sparkle to add everything together and I think that is just a simple look and you can recreate these looks at home again as I mentioned mm. by just piecing together pieces in your wardrobe. Yeah. And Nico's cosy now. We have the cosy look and I love an all grey look for winter. This is going to keep you toasty as the days get colder and Obviously, your, if your head is warm and your hands and your feet, you're, you're insulated. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start off with this gorgeous hat. It's kind of got a drop of detail with the, uh, the back and a bobble. It actually is kind of sewn down like that. So really cute, a lovely detail and a really gorgeous quality, cosy hat for a good price. Then we're going to go on to the bubble dome earrings again. These are in white gold. So the others we saw were in gold. Now we're going to go and look at this beautiful layering piece. And again, as I mentioned, monochromatic dressing, you can piece all the different pieces you have in your wardrobe. I love a grey look. Mm. So if you have a pair of, you know, a grey knit, you want to add a grey robe coat. I love this robe coat. It's got the stitching detail. And I think a robe coat really is like a, a, a uniform in itself. You know, you don't need anything else. You can just throw it over. And then once you have the basics yeah. underneath, it's a statement. Then this is a gorgeous, lovely um, knit. It's nice and loose, really comfortable and can be layered up. And then we're going to go on to, these are a, kind of a faux suede jogger, uh, really comfortable elasticated waist. They have lovely stretch to them. They range up to a size 18. And again, a lovely zip pocket detail. And we're gonna go uh, to the shoes here, a lovely runner, so handy. You can't beat a lovely classic uh, big kind of chunky runner in the winter we have the pop the metallic silver to really tie in the look together and she is ready for her day of uh, Christmas shopping <laughs> not to stress anyone out oh god <laughs> we'll no get you on board you yet. Will, don't you, will you worry we'll get you on board Rosalind thank you so thank much, you so much for joining me. us once thank again you. we'll take a quick break now but still to come crime author Jeffrey Archer is sharing some of his grisly inspirations plus we've got wait for it deep fried Mars bars and a sneak peek at the latest adventures of one Paddington bear. We'll see you with that in three. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Mommy, please! No! Mommy, please! Yes, I'm not going in there! I am not! Stop! Daddy! 
have a question. The Lord has compassion and love, slow to anger and rich in mercy. The Lord has compassion and love. Yes, welcome back to the final hour of this morning's Island AM. If you're only just joining us, you've just missed Tom Cruise, Ryan Gosling, Oprah. And... Sorry about that. Kylie just left the building as well. Now, uh, coming up this hour, we speak to the author behind 27 number one bestsellers. Jeffrey Archer is spilling the tea on his many grisly crime novels. Uh, plus, from a new Saoirse Ronan Oscar vehicle to the latest adventures of Paddington Bear, we're previewing the latest in movies and TV. Shiva's returned to the kitchen for seconds. You can't keep me out of the kitchen today, guys. My sweet tooth is thanking everyone in the building today because Chrissy Gibson is here. And the next dish now, this might divide opinions, Chrissy. You think? Well, I think it, it, it has potential to be controversial. Sure, OK, so deep fried bounty bar, I, I get it. I mean, it does sound kind of American, doesn't it? Like gluttonous. It is, isn't it? But, you know, we do love our fried food. Yes. And come on, what's wrong with the deep fried bounty bar? Oh, you, you can for use me, Mars. nothing. Nothing. Oh, it's so good. But listen, if you've got any leftover Halloween candy, I'm going to take care of Stick you. Stick in the deep fat fryer. Okay. Now we'll have a final check on your morning paper, starting with the Sunday Independent, which leads with gap between big two titans as Martin targets Fine Gael. The paper reports on a new opinion poll which finds that while Fine Gael remains the country's most popular political party, Fine Fall are quickly closing the gap ahead of the general election. Front page of the Business Post reads Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael to woo middle class with tax cuts. The paper writes that battle lines are now being drawn on issues of economic and enterprise policy between the three large parties vying to lead the next government. The Sunday Times leads with Donald Trump victory is the worst result, the Taoiseach is told. The paper writes that Taoiseach Simon Harris has been warned that a Donald Trump victory in Tuesday's US presidential election could significantly impact Ireland's windfall corporation tax receipts within a year of the former president retaking the White House. On to the tabloids in the Irish Mail on Sunday leads with Why did our baby boy die from meningitis? The paper reports that the parents of a seven-month-old baby have called for an independent inquiry into how their child died from suspected septic shock after contracting meningitis. The Sunday Mirror leads with horror of kids' care deaths. The paper claims that up to 227 children have died in state care, according to a new dossier. And finally, the Sunday World goes with the headline, Cartel's Shot of Coffee. The paper states that two men associated with the Kinahan cartel have opened a coffee shop in Dublin months after being released from jail. Now, we have been talking this morning about the C word, 52 sleeps till That's it. That's the, all. the day itself. Um, and people have been texting in and we actually have got a photo. Rosie texted oh, in saying herself and her daughter, Lily Rose, they stuck their tree up on the 1st of November. There it is. Now, does that not bring you joy? Of course it does. Joy and happiness. It does. Twinkly lights and fabulousness. Yes. Yeah. It's a great tree. The it's a beautiful is tree. Enough. We need every bit of happiness that we can. Come on, bring okay. up the trees, I say. OK, well, Aoife says, I do my shopping every January in the sales. You were talking about this. Yeah. Loads of expensive candles, all half price, to put away in boxes in the attic until December. Yeah, Annette says, nice. we start in January and at the moment we have ours wrapped, spent from 11 till the 7th, wrapped 150 presents. What? You've got more than, in your family than me if you've 150 Whoa, presents. Love wouldn't. the show. She, no, play, from, from 11 o'clock till 7 o'clock, that's a full shift. Yeah. Full shift, that's she's been wrapping presents. But it's all done now. So Fair play to you, Annette. I hope Absolutely. you're eating mince pies and drinking mulled wine while you were up the presents. <laughs> oh. Pauline says, I love Christmas. I've started the shopping. My tree is going up next week and got a new baby. Uh. Can't wait to spend Christmas with it. Will be a busy one for me and Wilson's Butcher's Wrath Farnham. Happy Christmas. Happy okay. Christmas and already. And she got a plug in as well, Pauline. Oh, <laughs> oh my God, look what Anita. Anita is my spirit animal. Go I on. love Christmas. I've all my decorations up since September what? 1st. <laughs> Inside and out. Have most of my shopping done. Only a few bits left to get. I like to be organised. It's never too early for Christmas. I do have Christmas FM on all day. Merry Christmas to you all. OK. I can't believe well, I'm being wished. Well, that station doesn't actually go on until November. 
the end you, of the month. I'm but sure there's Christmas ones you can get online. Yeah. No, I, I know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a digital, uh, there's an app you can download. I can't believe I've been phone. wished just... Merry Christmas already. Dashing through the snow. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> what has up the stage? Well, well, look, I, you, you might like the sound of this, and anybody who has a dog in their house might like this too. Aldi have announced, you know, like, yeah, the countdown is, is, is officially on. But the advent calendars have been up in shops for an age. Yeah. Oh, I love a good advent calendar. Yeah, oh, yeah. And you, can, and you can spend a lot of money on an advent There's calendar really if nice you ones. wish. Well, they've now launched a meaty dog biscuit advent calendar. OK, I don't want that one. OK, no, no. <laughs> Full of crunchy biscuit treats uh, for, your, for the dog in your life. Uh, but yeah, they've got a puzzle advent calendar if you want to get uh, mini puzzles for the kids to solve and a sensory toy advent calendar. I love the sound of this. Oh, that's fabulous. 24 sight, touch and sound toys to add stimulation for those who might need it. My... But the American branch, yeah. I've gone a bit further than that. They've got a sorted tea and coffees advent calendar. They've got a gourmet cheese advent mm. calendar, including everything from red Leicester to bruschetta to black truffle cheddar. There's a slimes calendar. I, don't I like that. <laughs> yeah. A scented candles advent calendar. And the one that our producer uh, wants to try yeah. and get his hands on is a wine advent calendar. Uh, 24 wine samples from all around the world. It will cost you $60. My sister would love that one now. Actually, I Can... should shut up because my sister's going to get me the dog calendar now because... Because you said, yeah, the meaty biscuits. I did. I know I did um, eat dog food by but accident the thing about an advent small. calendar, aren't you? It's dog food to tastes have... nice. OK, but aren't you supposed to have it in the morning? So if you're getting the wine advent calendar, it's yeah. going to be a little bit tricky. That's, yes, Remember the ones that you just opened problem. and there was cardboard and all there was was a picture? Of yeah. Some no, no, that was, there was chocolate and just somebody took it on you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was literally just a picture. I'm, I don't know, we I'm a bit of a family. Grinch for these. <laughs> the 80s. I, I don't know about all these, especially the dog one with the dog toys. Like, that's 24 new toys in your house. Yeah. Just they eat them and make the mess. Wash them. Sorry, the mess. At least with wine, you can consume it. Anyway. She's and a cheese. minimalist. I am a minimalist, a minimalist. Grinch. Yes. OK, okay. now all we'll right. be charging. Oh, let us know actually what you think. 0896 111 Are they ridiculous or are you all in? <laughs> Cheese and wine. Yay. We'll be chatting to Jeffrey Archer about his latest crime caper after the break. So we'll see you then. You're very welcome back to the show. Our next guest is one of the world's most popular authors and has topped bestseller lists around the globe. And he's back with another classic called An Eye for an Eye. Joining us on the line now is the brilliant Geoffrey Archer. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Martin. Uh, before, before we start talking about, we know you want to talk about other things, but we need to talk about the book first. So, um, William Warwick, your Scotland Yard Chief Superintendent. What is he involved in this time? What's the case? This time, he's been asked by the Prime Minister to solve a case where their man has been sent to Saudi Arabia to close a three billion arms deal. But his agent, a Lebanese agent, decides he'll switch to the French and gets our man in jail. And Chief Superintendent, as he is in this book, heading towards becoming commissioner, is put in charge of getting him out of jail. All right, but all it's, right. It's a very complicated story, this, but involves you enlisting the help of an ex-forger to create a document. How did that happen and how did you get in contact with him? Well, I have two advisers, uh, uh, Johnny Sutherland, who was chief superintendent in the murder squad, and uh, uh, Michelle Roycroft, who was in the arts and antiques squad. And I said to Michelle, have you ever met a forger? She said, I put the best one in jail. And he's come out and is now going straight. I said, I need to meet him because I need a copy of the Declaration of Independence as if it had been written by Thomas Jefferson. Because if the fake was good enough, it would be worth £100 million. Because out there somewhere, we know Jefferson wrote it. We know he sent it to a member of parliament in England but we don't know where it ended up. And if anyone were to find it, it would be worth 100 million. So I had a copy made by Billy Mumford, this remarkable forger. There, there it, is. it is. There I am with Billy. And the experts cannot tell the difference. Wow. But it ain't worth 100 million. Wow. 
That is amazing. My uncle was, uh, uh, before he passed away, was a handwriting expert for the Gardaí here in Ireland. So I'm, I'm fascinated in this sort of stuff. And indeed, the research you have to do for your books. Do you have a team with you for all of this stuff? I think research, Elaine, is very important. You have to convince the reader that it's true. You have to mix that, the impossible. If you, if you would do something that doesn't feel right, readers won't have it. They hate coincidence. But let me give you an example. I was on board a ship between, with my wife between Venice and uh, Athens, and I was giving a lecture. And one of the, uh, one of the people said, uh, who would you vote for if you were an American, Jeffrey? And uh, I said I'd vote for Nikki Haley, who was knocked out by Trump. But if she'd beaten Trump and stood against Biden, I said I would have voted for Nikki Haley. And if Biden had stood aside and Camilla Harris had come on the scene, I would have still voted for Nikki Haley. And someone was tapping away at the back on their phone, Elaine. And at the end, they came up and said, I sent your message directly to Nikki Haley. Wow. Oh, I said, how do you know her? And she said, she's my daughter-in-law. If I put a coincidence like that in a book, the point I'm making, Elaine, they would laugh at me. So research is key, even though uh, you're um, an expert at it at this stage. Now, we've mentioned Trump. We better um, talk about it. We have to talk about him now because uh, the election is on Tuesday. Um, I know you're very politically active yourself. Uh, how do you feel about the state of affairs in the States at the moment? It's switching every week. I had a distinguished former Texas senator speaking in Oxford who said Trump would win. His speech was so good, I went to hear him when he came to London when he said Camilla Harris would win. I said, can you make up your mind? He said, no, I can't. But... <laughs> A fact came out this morning, which may be important and may not be. There's a poll in Iowa showing that Camilla Harris is four points in the lead in Ohio, which wow. Trump won easily. He was eight points ahead in Ohio a week ago. He hasn't even bothered to go there. He thinks the seven key states in particular, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, Nevada, and Georgia are the most important. But if she were to win Iowa, Iowa, and that was reflected through the seven vital states, she will win the whole thing easily. But the poll, of course, gets off the hook by saying it's within the possibility of getting it wrong. They mm. love that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the margin of error. The margin of error that always comes up. Um, so... We're hearing stories today, we're reading in our own papers here in Ireland, that a Trump win will be economically damaging for Ireland. But it's going to have a rippling effect throughout the world if he were to return to the oh, White yes. House. Oh, yes. It'll have an amazing effect, Martin, because I, the Ukraine will be the loser. Uh, don't be surprised if Trump wins. Although there's an interim period between winning the election and being inaugurated in January, don't be surprised if he gets on an aeroplane to Moscow to go and see Vladimir Putin. Don't be surprised. A change in the world order if that happens in a significant way. Now, there was another um, election yesterday in the UK, which is as closer to home for you, I know. Um, the leader of the Conservative Party is now uh, Kemi Badenoch. How do you feel about that? Absolutely delighted. But then, of course, the Conservatives were the first party to have a Jewish prime minister, the first party to have a bachelor prime minister, the first party to have three women prime ministers, the first party to have an Indian prime minister. Why should we be surprised that we now have the first black leader of the opposition? Because we are the progressive party. Mm. But she does say that her, her plan isn't in the long term. It's uh, the short term, sorry, it's the long term. She's aiming towards uh, 2030 as her, her next goal for, for, for re-election for the Conservative Party. Will she last long enough to rebuild the party? Oh, the rules have changed, Elaine. The last election was won on a base, a sand base, of 33.8%. When Tony Blair was Prime Minister, a year after the election, he was plus 49 in people's minds. The current Prime Minister is already minus 36 
after only 12 weeks. So this could be an exception. Not only that, people change their minds a lot more quickly this day, these days. And you may, might find that the golden rule, if you've got 100 majority, you're going to do two terms, is no longer realistic. Mm. OK. Now, we have to talk about this. We're, we're going to step away from politics for a moment. But you have a, a bit of a problem with Taylor Swift. Because... Oh, oh she's a menace. <laughs> Why is Taylor Swift a menace? Can you please menace? explain this? She's a menace. I love her, but she's a menace. My pub down the road is called The Black Dog. And I've been going there for 30 years, eating my fish and chips and my shepherd's pie very happily. And then she, without informing me, mentions The Black Dog in one of her songs. And I couldn't get into my own pub because there were 200 young ladies between the age of 16 and 22 blocking the entire road and taking photographs of the black dog. If only she had said, and my fa you'll find my favourite author sitting in the corner, <laughs> all would have been well. <laughs> Maybe next time she might do that for you because I know she's thrown her, her hat into the ring for Kamala Harris so oh, yeah. um, maybe she might be more amenable if uh, Kamala wins and you can all go to the pub together. How about that? Very good combination, if I may say so. I but then so. I've known, being married to Mary Archer, I've known for some time that women are naturally superior to men. Ah, you are wise. And that's why they've lasted this long. <laughs> Listen, thank you Great so you, much for joining, for joining us. us. It's been a lovely chatting to you. OK. Uh, Jeffrey's thank newest you novel. very much indeed. Jeffrey's newest novel, An Eye for an Eye, is available now in all good bookstores. <laughs> now, after the break, what's better than a Mars bar? Well, a deep fried one, of course. We're back in the kitchen. I'm doing it, actually, next. <laughs> You're cooking? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Fodgy Ireland AM. Now, the legendary deep fried Mars bar has been a Scottish delicacy for years, but are you brave enough to try it? I might be persuaded. Now, Chrissy Gibson is back to work her magic, and I'm going to help her in a little while, but for the moment, I've been told to sit down here and behave myself. So, Chrissy, take it away. <laughs> Good luck with that, Elaine behaving herself. How do you try I didn't know this was a, a Scottish. Uh, it's yeah. originally, I lived in Edinburgh, and they deep fry, they batter and deep fry everything in, yeah. in yeah. Scotland. Yeah. Good. Everything. Well, we're going to do a few today. We're going to do bounty bars with freshly sliced pineapple. Oh, yummy, gorgeous. We're gonna do Mars bars, we're gonna do uh, Milky Way bars. You can do basically <sighs> anything that gets gooey in the center. Um, and I, I like the bounty personally because, well, uh, not only am I a fan of coconut, but it's really good with the sliced pineapple. Oh my this goodness. is interesting. A this little chocolate covered yeah. pina colada. Now, this so sounds you, like something this, even I might manage to do. This actually could not be easier, okay? We're going to use 120 grams of self-raising flour, and we're going to use soda water with that. Soda when, water? Yeah, when you use soda water to make your batter, um, you get a, sort of a lighter, fluffier batter. Like a tempura or something? Yes, exactly. That's that's what we're going for, and it, that's how you get that sort of See, texture. I know, I know look at you on your face. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to use 250 mils of the soda water, and... Uh, you might not need it all. So at the beginning, maybe just pour some of it in. All right, whisk this together. You see it bubbling up? Yeah, immediately. Do you need to get the bubbles out of it? Oh, well, no. the, bubbles, the bubbles will go out, but yeah. you see the effect that it has. And so, the, you know, when you add it to the hot oil, it, it's, it's a different texture. How much hot oil did you put in again? Uh, you want at least a liter. Oh. So you want it to be good and deep. And what kind of oil? Just vegetable Or oil? you can use a, a deep fat fryer. What's that? What type of oil? Is it just vegetable? Vegetable oil. I like, I usually use safflower oil. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, listen, that's your batter. You just need the soda oh. water and the flour. That's okay? it. That's it. But you guys, this is a great way to, you know, have some fun and use up some of your leftover Oh, Halloween yeah. candy. Leftover Halloween all, candy. I know. All yeah. that leftover Halloween all candy. All of the loads of it. That's so it. you just pop this right into the, the oil, okay? I'm going to do the bounty bars first so you guys can taste it with the pineapple. You fry these. Uh, you want the oil to be about 160 degrees. You fry them for th three minutes, say, yeah. okay? okay? And that's enough time to, f to brown them and to get the insides nice and gooey. All right. Mm -hmm. So 
We'll do some Mars bars as well. Anybody feel like dipping? Elaine? Well, I suppose I might Come on. Have. I've got no. a pair of gloves for you. Okay, yourself here. useful. Come on. I am quite useful in other ways, not normally cooking, but even if, if I mess this up, it would be a miracle. So Char these, uh, are, uh, these, are, um, uh, these are these are Milky Way and these yeah. are Mars. Oh, no, look, my big fat ham hands can't get into your tiny little gloves. I'll get them. Oh, they are small. Them. Yeah. <laughs> You're like O.J. Simpson. <laughs> No, you guys are going to get the first ones. <laughs> right. Now, I forgot my tongs today. Well, I'm not going to injure myself, of but I'm sure, we things, can, I'm sure we can improvise. Of all the things for me to forget, I forgot my tongs. So you, you use either a tongs or a serrated spoon to take these out. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm improvising today because I... With a fish slice. I knew I forgot something when yeah. I left the house. Okay, so just uh, dip your Mars bar okay. into the batter. Just nice and thick so it's coated. And then just drop it right in. Keep your fingers away from the oil, obviously. Yeah. Watch your fingers. Oh, oh, oh no! Did it, get you? <laughs> Did it get you? No. Sorry, I just, so don't plop it in. Don't plop it. <laughs> place it in. Gently place it in. Okay, I'll do that now. Is that not better? Yeah, so. There you go, good. Well and done. Then, um, not and the, then, will I do the rest of them? Yeah, do, those are the three musketeers. Oh. Any of these are good, but I, the bounty is good with sliced pineapple. Yeah, so. so talk to me about, how did you discover that? Nigella. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, this is one of those things that I did try after Halloween one year because, you know, when you've got, when you've got four kids trick-or-treating, it's, you know, you yeah, end up that, with a, lot of a bit of extra. A, a bounty, if you will. Yeah, yeah and they yeah. are, they're decadent. They're so, fun. They're naughty. No, so is it just um, fresh pineapple then, just to... Yep. Okay. So, okay. you put these on a towel, okay. and this is one of those desserts that you do have to eat straight right away. away. So there's no making these ahead of time. You have to eat them straight away while they're still Piping nice hot. and crispy. Oh, so goodness, look at that. I'm going to give you guys a They're couple. like dessert chicken balls. You know the ones you get in Chinese? Yeah. It's lovely. All right, so okay. hand one to Which Shiva. is this? What is this? That's one? Bounty. bounty. Now you do have you like a knife bounty? there. Yes, I do like Bounty. These are bound to be. These are bound to be hot. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, can I go over there now? Have Please. I finished my very, very hard work? I'm done with you. Thank you very much. You've been released. Michelin star on the way for yeah, me. Yeah, you did great. Okay, so I'm going to try it with the fresh pineapple. Maybe I'll give it a second. Oh, it's quite hot still. And um, deep fry. Oh. Oh my goodness. They're. Oh. It, it, they're. Listen. They're decadent. Okay. Mmm. Do you know? Quite uh, hot now. If you if you I'm ever go to Texas, if you ever go to Texas, they've got fried food festivals and they have fried butter. It's what? Rid it's ridiculous. Fried butter. Yeah, they 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 put ba they put batter over a chunk of butter and fry it. Mm. And they eat it like that. Uh huh. And it pops. What do you think? It's amazing Did you with, eat the it with the pineapple. With, yeah. With the pineapple. Mmm. Mmm. Isn't that good? Uh huh. Mmm. Oh I love coconut and I love pineapple. Yeah. But having them together it's, it's with a, batter and chocolate is a revelation. It I is mean, a great combination. And you saw yourselves, it could not be easier. Yeah. Just make sure you soda use the soda water, and, water. and flour. Yeah, that's right. You're going to want to raid now the kids' Halloween bags and see if there are any bounties because you're going to want to try this. And listen, you can always go and buy some. <laughs> you can indeed. Chrissy, thank Just you so much. Just so you have much. more candy at home, right? That is delicious. Thank you, Chrissy. My pleasure. For spoiling us today. Full recipe details are on our website. You can find more from Chrissy on Instagram at Take the Cake Dublin. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Now, after the break, Britain's best bear is back on the big screen. We're looking ahead to Paddington's latest venture after this. <laughs> Welcome back from Marmalade Loving Bears to Eddie Redmayne as a tough as nails assassin. There's a bit of everything coming to your screens, big and small this week. But of course, the main event is the culmination of the US presidential race. It's Trump v. Harris. And here to give us his take is our expert political commentator, Killian O'Sullivan. <laughs> I'm ready for this. This is the, I, all the battleground states in America are tuned into Ireland AM right now to be like, who are we going to vote for, Killian? What, what way will we swing it? Paddington is who we're going to vote for. <laughs> <laughs> the only on. one, the only on. one with the right option. Yeah, could, the marmalade mean. for everyone. Yeah, marmalade okay. sandwiches for everyone. But let's discuss Trump v. Harris, which is a documentary coming to Virgin Media One tomorrow night. Yeah, so like, start tomorrow night, of course, you know, the big vote is happening. It's already happened for about 70 million Americans already on the early yeah. voting, which is huge. I mean, that's 
like big, yeah. big, big numbers, bigly numbers, if you will. Um, this is going to be a very interesting week. We are weeks away from a result. I will just say that. Don't think that because the election is happening, we're going to get an answer. You remember last year, not last year, four years ago, it was right up to the 6th of January before there was anything, oh, yeah. you know, quote unquote, confirmed. So, yeah, we're not going to get a result for a while. There'll be a lot of pundits talking about a lot of stuff. But just to get you into the mood, this is a doc on Virgin Media just looking at both sides. And uh, it's this election cycle has been an interesting one and as much as if you just compare it to let's say Obama's Obama's was all about you know yes we can he was the vision he was the future mm. he was the thing you were voting for whereas this cycle both parties are just pointing fingers at the other one saying oh they're worse vote for me they're not giving you a reason to vote for them they're trying to give you a reason not to vote for the other mm -hmm. so it's kind of like a battle but, but, of the but, losers but that's what American presidential elections are like you know, like if you there was a movie made some years back called Primary Colours John Travolta was, uh, played the lead and it was, we were told it was loosely based on, on Bill Clinton. But, it know, is, but even if you look, dirty tricks if you look at the petty stuff that, that Trump has been doing, the whole, the, the McDonald's shtick that he did that yeah. was off the back of Kamala Harris claiming that she'd worked at McDonald's, although allegedly she never did, and then Biden calling American people garbage. So then the next day, Trump appears for a press conference in a garbage truck. It's, it's Well, he couldn't get into stuff. the garbage truck. Well, no, the I know. A few times. Did you see Kamala Harris was on Saturday Night Live last night and they no. said to her, um, you know, you can do something that Donald Trump can't. You can open doors. When you get there. <laughs> yeah, but it's going to be interesting because, like, the Democrats are pulling out all the stops. They're going through the roller decks, and every celebrity friend they have is going up there and endorsing. Yeah. And this will be interesting to see because in previous years we saw with um, Hillary when she ran, the celebrity endorsements don't really do a no, whole I lot. No, I don't know well, if they I do. Know, I, I do. But I do wonder about Taylor Swift uh, and because the yeah, power of the Swifties. She's meant yeah. to be quite influential, isn't yeah, she? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we. But we will wait and see. But we'll be watching this with interest tomorrow night at 10 o'clock. Yeah, so that's Virgin Media's documentary, Trump v. Harris. OK, now before we settle down to watch that, uh, there's a new drama. It's a four-part drama and it's going to be playing out over, over four nights yeah. here on Virgin Media 1. Uh, Until I Kill You. Yeah, so this is from the same production company behind Line of Duty. So you can tell it's from good stock, right? It's going to look really well. It's going to be paced really well. The actual story is harrowing. It's based on a true story of a woman who was nearly killed by the hands of a man who shouldn't have been freed in the first place to do it. Uh, it is a kind of a story about how the legal system let down this woman ultimately mm -hmm. and how this psychopath reigned his terror over a number of women. And after he went to jail, even more names are coming forward of his victims. Uh, so again, if you're into these true crime podcasts, if you're a fan of The Red Room, Jenny Claffey's uh, uh, podcast, stuff like that, you're going to love a series like this because it you know, dives into that dark world. But if you want something lighthearted, maybe not for you, but um, a really good, good series though. And yeah, will yeah. this be out once a week? Uh, no, it's going to no, play across across, across one week every right. evening. Yeah, so four nine nights. o'clock tomorrow evening okay. is the Sean first Evans, episode. Sean Evans, who you'll know from Endeavour. Yeah, and you almost won't recognise him in this. No. And yeah, you'll yeah. you'll 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 want to hate him and, and after Maxwell watching Martin. this. But yeah, he plays. That's a reflection of how good he is in this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. I'll be watching that. Um, let's move on to something coming to Now TV this week. Day of the Jackal. Yes, Eddie Redmayne plays a, a hitman for hire. This is born ultimatum kind of in an episodic series. This looks brilliant. Mm -hmm. I love these kind of, you know, MI5, CIA, spy, espionage things. This is a hitman for hire who is amazing at his job at what he does. And uh, he meets his match with a, a British operative. And it's a cat and mouse game of, of trying to catch the other. Eddie Redmayne plays this person who can adapt his face, make himself, you know, using prosthetics, can age himself, can travel like a ghost in and out of countries. Um, it's a 10-part series. You can see from the production value, this looks like a movie. Nowadays, we're treated to this on yeah. TV. Yeah. TV no longer is just, you know, cheap and cheerful. This is high budget stuff and you're getting an Oscar winner to play the lead in it. So, you know, there's a few Bob put behind this as well. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is coming to Sky and now TV and I am all about it. Yeah, with, I, I remember the movies. Edward Fox was in the uh, first movie, The Day of the Jackal, and, and uh, then, of course, Richard Gere and Bruce Willis were in the remake that occurred. But this looks good. Lashana Lynch will know because she was 007 well, in the, the last Bond. The, the controversial 007, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, so yeah, this is, there's, there's a couple of crossovers. There's a, there's a couple of people who've been in Bond movies and are, are also in this, and that's not to say that there's any direct connection other than it's the same world they live in. Yeah. And uh, it is a world that I'm, I'm dying to get stuck into, to be honest. <laughs> and this, this is stuff. the thing that Eddie Redmayne said he was getting training for in the combat. He's ripped. 
ripped. By oh, the way, really? there's, there's like unnecessary shirtless shots. I mean, come on, we all have it, Martin. Am I right? We all well, have that physique. It's in my contract. I have to get my shirt on. Some of us are just Hillian more modest about it. We don't yeah. do gratuitous nudity. No, not on this show. Not no. on this show. No. Right? There's a six no. pack in there somewhere. I yeah, just don't it's hiding. Flaunt it. it's, like, it's there. It's, it's a... Anyway, yeah, he's in great nick for this. In fairness to him, um, so uh, uh, yeah, no, he is. He's he can carry himself well. And I think if you're watching stuff like this, like I know. Um, uh, Keanu Reeves is great at this as well. He really dives into the arms training so that when he's holding a gun, it, they're not like holding it like this and it's very obvious they don't know what they're doing. They're well able to do exactly what they need to do with the okay. gun. So it helps you buy into that world of believing that this person really can do what they're, they're doing on screen. Okay, we're looking forward to this, the day of the jackal. And so we're moving now to the big screen. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Saoirse Ronan, she's been in the news for a variety of reasons. She has, she uh, has. Uh, but she, her movie <laughs> Blitz. So yes. yeah, this is set in World War Two, and it is again, it's a you know, it's it's a harrowing story of a mother who essentially you know has lost her child in amongst the chaos that is World War Two, and it's about this small boy's journey uh, yeah. to try and you know recouple himself with his mom, and it's a great one. It's Apple TV here behind it, so it is in the cinemas, but then it's also going to go to streamers. I'd say it's only going to do a limited cinema run so that it's eligible for the awards, mm -hmm. because there's a real bang of that off this. Oh yeah. I mean, her performances in this, she's she's great at everything she does when she's on screen. Um, but it is, it's a, it's, it's a, a really good kind of period set piece. But, but we're watching the danger that this, that this little boy encounters as he tries to make his way home. It's the dangers that, that well, London that, face during, That's exactly during it. And the it's, it's kind of drawn in that kind of Dunkirk, the kind of the, the 1917, the kind of, yes. you live in the suspense, you live in that kind of, uh, at, at that time, of course, we have no point of reference. I mean, the biggest thing we had to come through was COVID where we couldn't leave our 5K restriction zone. It was, and we had Netflix, so we were fine. But at this time, you're literally, every time you walked out on the street, you didn't know if you'd make it home. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, it, it, it helps paint that picture of what it must have been like. That coupled up with the fact that, you know, your son is missing is, is, is a very scary prospect. Okay. And finally, let's move on to another one coming to cinemas this Friday, Paddington in Peru. The eagerly anticipated third movie in the series. He had to go to Peru. It was like E.T. had to go home. This Paddington is, had to go to Peru. This is, of course, where he came from, his origin story. He goes back to find his aunt who Lucy. is is missing. And uh, look, this is just... Paddington getting up to all sorts in a new environment. I mean, he's wrecked and ruined London. He's wrecked and ruined the house. <laughs> and now it's an opportunity for him to unleash his madness onto one of the biggest playgrounds for him in the world, which is yeah. the jungle. And uh, yeah, from that, we meet all of these different characters. And it's just an opportunity to really expand the Paddington world and, you know, continue the, the charm that we get from this little bear, even like the small that you'll see in the trailer where he gets his passport for the first time and how his passport photo, how he gets that done. It's just this funny little, very light, beautiful to watch from toddlers right up to your granny and granddad. Everyone can enjoy a movie like this. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, Hugh Bonneville, he, he was, he, I interviewed him and he, he said, he said, no matter what I do, I will always be Mr. Brown. Yeah. No yeah. matter what I do in my career. <laughs> He's such a cold following. Killian, thank you so much for coming and chatting my to pleasure. us. My pleasure, my pleasure. The telly and the cinema sorted for. Sorted for the week. Now, earlier on, we baked some seven layer chocolate bars, and here's how we did it. Mix your biscuit crumbs and melted butter in a baking dish, then pour condensed milk across the base. Layer the chocolate chips, coconut flakes, and nuts, pressing down firmly and drizzling more milk on top. Bake at 30 degrees until the coconut has turned to golden brown, then allow to cool before slicing into bars. Coming up tomorrow, Tom Kittens, Natasha Hamilton has gone solo, but will the band ever be whole again? Ooh. She joins us to spill the tea. Uh, we're taking a look at TikTok's latest fashion trend, Corp core. Think blazers and blouses you can wear beyond the boardroom. And Kilkenny hurler Richie Hogan tells us the story of his dazzling career. All that plus the new sports and whether you're waking up to Ireland AM is back tomorrow from 7 a.m. Okay, we asked a whole load of things. <laughs> We've really started it now. Yeah, We've yeah, opened yeah. Pandora's box this morning when it comes to Christmas. Um, yes, her beautifully wrapped. Yeah, indeed. Um, first of all, Richie says, please says, uh, say a big happy birthday, 70th birthday to my dad, Jimmy. Uh, 
There he is. There, so happy birthday. Happy birthday. Good man. OK, um, and Zoe says, uh, the Cal Delaney family in Kilkenny have our beautiful tree up. Uh, the children decorated it this year. Let's have a look at that. Look at that. What a job. Whoa. You deserve another week off school for that do. kid. You mm. do. And Eamon also says, it's never too early to put up the decorations. Mine go up on Halloween night every year. Roll on Christmas. There's okay. his tree. Do you know what? Whatever brings you joy, just go for it. And Absolutely. We have a few Grinches away. Do you know what? I can kind of understand, but really, really. Yeah. Um, Nuala says, guys, it's just the 3rd of November. Please, please, can everyone just get a grip? Christmas is at the end of December. Putting them up sooner is just devaluing. Ah, no, it's devaluing not. No, it's not. De sorry, no. No, no. no, no. I don't sorry, think Nuala, that's Nuala. Sorry. Mm. I don't think you can do no. too much Christmas now, personally. Dee says, I have all the shopping done, ordering the turkey next week so that I can chill out and enjoy the festivities without scrambling around at the last minute. There Getting to go. watch everybody else as yeah. we panic and oh, struggle. Oh, yeah. Christmas that's Eve nice. panic. Nice that's being nothing like smug it. Don't want to be panicking. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. Not yet, but hopefully I want to be sitting back and enjoying the the Christmas month old Christmas tree. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> anyway. A lot of people are actually doing their online shopping while watching Ireland Jam this morning. Multitasking. Multitasking. Fiona's doing that. Impressed. So good luck with that. I hope we're you got it all done, Fiona. Anyway, we'll Have see you again Sunday. soon. Bye-bye.